Well, greetings 535 people. This is Dr. Keith Schubert. Um, week 2 lecture stuff on matrices and vectors. This is going to be a semi-optional one. Basically review of uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and um, how these basic operations are done on matrices and vectors and a little bit on what they are. Let's imagine that we had um, three real numbers. Now, we denote a real number by this kind of special scripty double-backed R. And if I have three elements of them, we use this in a subscript. So we, that means three real numbers put together in what we call a tuple or a group um, connected together. So, um, you know, this would be R3. And, you know, if I came in here, this would be, you know, R4 so on and so forth. So that we use this as a notation to allow you to be able to tell how many elements inside of our arrays. Now, I'm going to stick with R3. Let's say that I had some x, which was an element of R3. Now, what that means is I have a vector x, and x is made up of three real numbers. So for instance, um, I could say an example of an x that's in R3 would be 1, 2, 3. So that would be an example of it. Um, you know, I could also say y could also be an element of R3, and maybe y is equal to, uh, let's say, 4, 5, 6. Now they don't have to be sequential. I could technically you know, I have a Z that's R3 that could be negative 2, 17, 43. Um, I just happen to be really boring and just have picked these particular numbers to go in because I'm just doing counting. Um, but it's by no means required to be that way. Now let's say, for instance, these are the same size. I'd like to add them. Now, why is it important that they're the same size? Well, we have to say, what do we mean by adding them together? Well, to do that, let me kind of talk a little bit about the components. Here's my x, and we've said x is an R3. So I could say that my vector x is equal to x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3. By which this means the first component of x, second component of x, third component of x. Another way of saying this would be that x right, is equal to it's a set of x sub i's. We often just draw one that's in there. Because what we're saying is x sub i, i is now a variable and it runs through all of them. Yeah. So now I'm going to talk about these individuals as if they're x sub i's on here. If I want to say that take x plus y. Now there's three elements in there. How do you add them? I mean, how do I not know that I should add 1 plus 6 maybe or, you know, do some other funny thing on them? How do I know how to keep each one? Well, some of it has to do, we have to make a choice on what we mean. If what we're talking here is, you know, your typical three space, X, Y, and Z, length, width, height, whatever you want to call it. Let's just use, its, you know, our, our normal dimensional sense here. You know, this, if, if I were using length, width, height, you know, I could say that I could add this length to this length, and that would at least make some sense. It doesn't necessarily make sense to add length to height to get anything intelligent out. So what we mean then by doing this addition is that I want to take the x sub i's plus the y sub i's, and I want to do that for all the i's. So. I'm going to make this type of a definition where I'm going to add them all up. You could kind of write it in, in our particular format. We've got 1, 2, 3, and plus 4, 5, 6. And what I mean by that then is 1 plus 4, 2 plus 5, and 3 plus 6. And then that is equal to 1 plus 4 is 5, and 2 plus 5 is 7, and 3 plus 6 is 9. Um, kind of odd, isn't it? Sorry. I have to make bad jokes even on videos. Um, 
So what we end up with here is obviously a nice simple way to do it. You just add the corresponding elements. I add xi to yi, do that for all of them, and you will end up getting what we want as our result. Now, this gives us a good way of handling how do we do addition for vectors. How about addition for things a little bit bigger? You know, and I right now have just an array of these things, but um, you know, what if I wanted something a little bit larger than that and I wanted to talk about addition? Well, let me erase this stuff here. Now, this is my spiffy new whiteboard. Hopefully I won't ruin this too quickly. Um, it saves an awful lot when I was doing it on paper before. I ended up with uh, going through a lot of paper and I didn't want to waste it after two videos worth. I had a stack of used paper and it was making me feel bad. Okay, so now we've got our clean spot. Let's talk, for instance, what would we mean about the next size up? In order to do addition of them, we have to have some idea of the size. So let's say I took a 2 by 3 matrix. Right, now if you notice, I'm still taking reals, and now before where I had just a single element, now I've got 2 by 3. What does that mean? If I said some A was an element of R2 by 3, what could A look like? Well, these right here, the first one, where I've got the two, that's your rows, and the three is your columns. And so, in this case, A has two rows and three columns. So, for instance, I could have one, two, three, four, five, six. That would be a two-row, three-column matrix. So, um, as a general rule, if the number of columns is bigger, then we usually call those fat matrices, and if they tend to have uh, more rows than there are columns, we call them, you know, tall matrices or skinny matrices. Uh, we can also call them, if they have more columns, short matrices. Um, some people put them together and call them either tall, skinny, or short, fat as the two options. Um, so that's kind of, if you ever hear somebody talking about a tall matrix or, you know, a short matrix or whatever else, that's what they're talking about. They're, they're letting you know, are there more columns or are there more rows? And then square is obviously the, the equal sized ones, and that's a very special case that comes up and is helpful to us under certain circumstances. Okay, but let's get back to the area we want to do addition to them. So let's say we have our, our A that's in this case. Let's say we also have a B that's also a 2 by 3 matrix. Um, and let's say this one will try to be a little more unique anyway. Uh, let's say 5, 7, 3, negative 1, um, 12, and minus 4. Just picking some numbers. Um, I do not attempt to say these are random. <laughs> they're they're human random. Human beings are horrible random number generators, though. So um, don't use a human as a human as a random number generator. Um, and amongst humans, I'm particularly bad. All right. So let's imagine we wanted to add these up, just like we did before. Right. We have different elements inside these matrices, we want to add the corresponding ones, which means I add the 1 to the 5. So I'll add these two, and I'll add the 3 to the 7, and the 5 to this 3 here. And the reason why we want to do that is, again, just to keep their corresponding locations, and it makes a little more sense to say, hey, look, this one is in this particular position for a reason. Um, and in a later video, I'll get into talking about the interpretations of what the different matrices mean, but that's kind of a more generic than this. This is kind of basic mechanics here. So again, we're going to associate each of these elements as I'm circling them here. So therefore, if I wanted to say A plus B, then what we would be wanting to do for this is we would have 1 plus 5, and we would have 3 plus 7, just following our things, 5 plus 3, and then on the bottom we'd have 2 minus 1, 
which is really 2 plus or minus 1, but that's kind of ugly to write. Uh, 4 plus 12, and then 6 minus 4. And so that's equal to 1 plus 5 is 6, 3 plus 7 is 10, 5 plus 3 is 8, 2 minus 1 is 1, 4 plus 12 is 16, and 6 minus 4 is 2. So if you notice, when I add A and B, I get a new matrix C that is also in the same exact dimension or from the same space from which I drew A and B. It is also a member of R2 by 3. This is basic addition as it is. So, you know, in order for two matrices or vectors to be compatible to do addition, I've got to be able to correspond the elements, which means they have to be the same size. Right? If I cannot add a 2 by 3 to a 3 by 2. It doesn't work because I don't know how to associate the elements in them. So somebody would have to make the matrices the same size and then I could do something with it. Alright, so that is our first step that goes on here, is to do addition. Now we want to talk about how do we do multiplication. And let me uh, clear out my space. Um, I guess I should mention subtraction real quick. Subtraction is also done exactly the same as addition. Um, just the same as we do in regular integers, you can do subtraction by adding a negative. All right, so um, you just do it element-wise and add up the negative of the second one, and then you are in perfect shape. So addition and subtraction really do fit nicely together. Uh, multiplication and division are not quite so neat in our case. But let's first talk about uh, multiplication, and then we'll talk about why division as we normally think of it, is not possible. There is something somewhat analogous to it, which will become very important to us in future situations. All right, um, so we want to do multiplication. And let's start off with the nicest of all realms, which is the um, same size square matrix. So let's imagine I have an A and a B that are elements of real 2 by 2. Um, and let's say that A is equal to, and I'm going to actually just name the elements rather than picking numbers at the moment, A11, and so this is row column. So this is first row, first column. So first row, second column, second row, first column, and second row, second column. And then B would similarly be named as B11, B21, B12, and B22. And I want to multiply A times B. Now, what do we exactly mean by doing multiplication in this sense? Well, you know, Getting into the challenges, there's a lot of ways you could potentially define this, but one that actually makes logical sense to us um, and gives us answers that is intelligent for where we're going on actually is designed to do a series of inner products. Yeah, I know, and so I will have to introduce the idea of what is an inner product here for a sec. Um, but let me first kind of set up the problem, and I'll show you what I mean by it in that sense. I'm going to take B and I'm going to move it over to a different position. Now, I tend to stick them um, in a spot I've, you know, there are other people who do this as well, um, but I do it in a way that I hope will actually make life a little simpler. I want to make this a little bigger too. I've got a whole big screen, so I might as well use it. So, A11, A12, A21, A22. And then I'm going to put B right up here. B11, B21, B12, and then I've got B22. 
and then the answer in this case is going to be the same size and I'm going to put the answer down here and the reason is what we're going to do to get this particular element right here that I've just circled I'm going to use this row and this column to generate it. And the way I'm going to do it is these elements are going to multiply and these elements are going to multiply. All right, so this is a multiplication. Multiply those and then in this direction to generate them I'm going to add. So I'm going to multiply A11 by B11 a12 by B21, and I will add those two together to generate this particular spot, which means this one is A11 B11 plus, I think that was this graph, now I plus, and then I add to it A12 times B21. Of course, in doing this, I have made it very difficult to fit inside my screen because I wrote large. All right, now, to get this one here, all I do is I look, well, it's got to be this column and this row. All right, now, to do that, I'm still going to follow the same multiplication rule. This element here multiplies this. So, in this case, I need A21 times B11. And then I'm going to add to it A22, right? that's the correct row, and it multiplies B21. Now, some things you might want to notice is kind of interesting. If you look, the inside numbers are always, always, always the same. I, that's actually required by this angle here the way I've done them. And the second thing you will notice is the outside always tells you the elements you're on. All right, so this is 1, 1 is what I'm generating. I'm generating the 1, 1. Here I'm generating the 2, 1 element. Row 2, column 1. Row 2, column 1. Because I'm using this one is the row and this one is the column. So I take the row number from here, column number from there. So that's why we organize them that way. So it does have a, some nice properties. Um, it seems like a strange way to do it at first, but it actually makes a lot of sense when you start seeing it. Therefore, to get this element, it's going to be this row times that column. So it's got to be A11, B12, this one times that one. And then plus, I'm going to have to kind of do this double line because I'm running out of space on the edge. And then A12 times B22. A12, B22. And again, you'll notice 1, 2 element, 1, 2 element, and the insides are the same. Um, once you get used to it, um, you can actually recognize this nice pattern and move down it. Um, I get the 1 elements here first, the 2 elements here and then I always have the element I'm going to. So this is the 2, 2 element. If you think about it for a sec here, I've got to be going to A2, and there's kind of an I here, and B, I, 2, because this is the 2, 2 spot. And what I'm doing is I am summing up from I equals 1 to 2. Now I wrote this in sigma notation. I could have written all of these in sigma notation. This particular one, if you hadn't done it, just to show that it's compatible, I could have used the same old rule. It's this row, this column, A21 times B12, A21, B12, and I add to that A22 times B22. Let me just kind of move that up because it looks like it's not in the space. It's in there. Hopefully that is uh, visible to everybody. Um, now, as a result of doing that, you'll notice we've kind of got a very nice, simple expression. If you check it, um, this is when I do i equals 1, I'd get a21b12. 
and then when i equals 2, what's being added to it, I'd have a22, b22. So both the sigma notation form and the regular use row column ones gives you the same exact answer. Um, now the question is, why do I call this inner product? Um, hopefully this is, no matter how big the matrix is, it's always got to be that way. Before I get to inner product, let me actually do one other thing on here. Um, we mentioned what makes a matrix compatible for multiplication, and this is one of those really important things that has to go. There has to be the same number of columns as in A as there are rows in B in order to do this kind of line up. It didn't matter how many rows were here. It doesn't matter how many columns are here. It just tells you how big is the final answer. But the thing that really matters is, since I'm matching the columns here to the rows here, I have to have the same number of columns in A as I do rows in B. So what that means, to be compatible for multiplication, I must have that A is in some R P by Q, right? and its columns has to be the same as B's rows. So B has to be in R Q by S, say. Um, I didn't use little r up here because I don't want to confuse big R or my funny capital R with, with little r, so I just skipped it. So in this case, same number of columns as rows, I can multiply A times B. But now think about it. Can I multiply B times A? I, this one we know is correct. And this one we know is correct because A has Q columns and B has Q rows. How about B times A? Can I even multiply them? Give you a second there to think about it. Um, now, a knee-jerk reaction for um, people to say would be no. And technically what you should say is that you can only multiply them if P equals S. Because if P and S are equal, then the number of columns of this one would equal the rows of this one, and they can again be multiplied. Now note that if I do A times B, the result A times B is in the size or an element of R of P by S. Now, if this was compatible, I mean P equals S, right, such that I had really this situation, that this would then be a P by P. Um, when I flipped it around and did the multiplication B by A, well, I always take the first one to become the number of rows, and the second one is the number of columns. So this, if P equals S, this would be R P by P. In order for this one to even work, it only works in the P equals S column. So it's not possible if P does not equal to S. Um, but if P does equal S, so I'll just put P does not equal S, then that's your answer. Your answer would be P by P, but that's trivial, P equals S. Over here, B times A, the first element of, or the number of rows of B is Q. And the number of columns of A, the second matrix, is Q. So this would be a Q by Q. And note, I haven't made any assumption that P equals Q. So note, just because I can multiply both A and B and B and A does not mean that A times B equals B times A. It's possible that you can't even write one of the two. <laughs> Even when you can write the two, they might not be the same size. If they're not the same size, they can't be the same answer. Um, so as a general rule, A, B does not equal B, A. Um, it's highly likely that there's not even an intelligent statement of, of how to form it. 
like we have here, you know, or they're the wrong size, even when they are the right size, where P, Q, and S are all the same number, um, as in a square matrix, you're still not guaranteed to get the same answer because the multiplication is going to be made up of different elements as it goes. It's only very special things we call regular matrices that have that property. So um, we don't want to, you know, give any delusions early on. Uh, if you are able to multiply both directions, they still are not guaranteed to be the same. They could be, but it's not guaranteed. So you cannot say that A and B commute. This is a very big difference between matrices and scalars. So commutativity is not guaranteed for my matrices for multiplication. Um, addition, yes. Addition commutes. Okay, so let's clear off the board again. And we'll talk a little bit about what we mean by doing an inner product for vectors. Um, so vectors, there's a lot of different ways you can multiply. Inner products, outer products, things like that. Um, for us, inner products, and this is how it is defined for um, physicists as well. Let's say I had X and Y as elements of R2. I'm just going to do 2 as a two-dimensional space at the moment. Now, in order for them to be compatible, similar to the way in which we defined what's going on with our multiplication for um, matrices, we're going to want them to line up such that I can do this same exact multiplication idea. Right? X1 multiplying Y1, X2 multiplying Y2, which technically means that this needs to be a um, vector that's kind of short and fat, if you like, and this one's tall and skinny. Right, so row vectors and column vectors come in, but um, realize this is the big key thing we want to do. It has to be compatible because we're going to multiply these and then add down the line. So we'll do the answer, dropping out here, will be x11 times y1, x1, y1, and then plus x2 times y2. So this is what we mean by doing this multiplication. Now, since this is how we're going to kind of define it, we want to say that this right here, now this is a scalar if you notice. So x dot y, this is one way we write it, dot product. Um, it can also be written, mathematicians use angle brackets for these, um, for inner products, which is x and y. There's a ton of different notations. If you want to consider them as actual matrices, which is often done inside of uh, computer programs and things of that sort, um, because it's easy to just say, hey, look, this is first column, first row, in which we're taking these now to be, this would be in a one by two matrix, and this is a two by one matrix, then what we have to do is flip, if they were both, um, two by ones, tall and thinny column situations, we would have to take the first one and transpose it. Transposing means to flip it on the main diagonal. If you flip x1, x2, main diagonal is 1, 1 through 2, 2 through 3, 3. To flip it means everything flips over. Where anything on the main diagonal stays, x2 would go over here. So if you transpose, you'd take this and you would just flip it and you'd end up with this tall, thin thing, which is exactly here, x1, x2. So that's what transpose means. It just takes this and makes it compatible for multiplication in a matrix sense times y. So these are all ways that you can write, but the answer of it is x1, y1 plus x2, y2 which we can write in our sum notation, sum from i equals 1 to 2 in this case, because that's how many elements there are, and that is of x, i, y, i. All ways that I can write the exact same thing. 
Now, there's one other form that's kind of interesting to us, um, which it turns out, and you might say, hey, why do I care about this anyway? What does it, what does it really mean? Um, believe it or not, it actually has some neat physical significance. So if I had x and y as two vectors in a plane, and this is two space, so two vectors in a plane here, Uh, this is the third time I've had to record this because somebody has called in, so I'm just going to pick up where I was before um, and hopefully blend these together. Um, so if you have these two vectors in a plane, x and y, um, the inner product is actually telling you something about this angle here between the two of them, which I'm calling alpha. Right? So what it's telling you is the length of x, which I'm going to write length of x this way. That's how long x is. And I multiply it by how long y is, and I multiply it by the cosine of the angle between them, which is alpha. This is also equal to this same inner product. Um, this is something I have proved, you know, and talk about a little bit later on, but I want you to at least know this from here. It's another way I can get this same exact thing. It becomes very important for us for a lot of trig relations, and therefore very important for us for how we handle an awful lot of these different matrix operations that's going to come down the line. And it's because of this importance that things come down. I'll explain this. This is norm notation, um, but that's something for a, a later one of these little videos. Plus, I don't know when the next person is going to call and break my video up. So, um, hopefully this has at least helped give you a quick rundown of what these are. Um, if you need to do more, then I suggest uh, looking up, trying some problems, and uh, come talk to me. We can do some in class as well. Uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all real soon. Have a good day. Bye.